Praise God. That's wonderful just to be here. And uh, before I, I forget, um, our dear sister mentioned to me tonight, there was a lady who was meant to be here tonight, Joan, isn't that right? And she was really looking forward to being here and she took a heart attack today. And I wonder if we just begin by praying for Joan, would that be okay? Father in heaven, we just thank you for our dear sister, your daughter, you love her so much. Uh, let that be uppermost in her mind right now. Your great love for her, nothing that happened to her today determines your love for her. Nothing that happened to her today, Lord, it tells her who she is. Your Holy Spirit tells her who she is. She's blessed. She's blessed and highly favored in the midst of whatever situation it is. We pray just for your life to rise up in her, the life that has overcome all the tribulation of the world. So bless her and her family today with only the peace that you can give. We ask this in Jesus' name. Praise God. Well, you know, this morning, actually, um, <coughs> There was a scripture I was speaking on, and, and I mentioned it came back to me there uh, during worship, and it was that lovely scripture, I mentioned to somebody we were having coffee, where the old man Simeon came into the temple and saw the baby Jesus. Do you remember that scripture? And in Luke 2, there's a lovely little verse where it says that he came into the temple in the spirit. And so everybody there in that temple only saw a baby, but in the spirit, he saw something totally different. And he said, my God, I can die in peace because I have seen the salvation of the world. Your salvation, you have prepared a light unto the Gentiles. He picked up Jesus and he said beautiful things over Jesus. And all little verses, his mom and dad were amazed. I mean, Mary and Joseph, they were amazed at the things that were said over Jesus. And when we see by the spirit, it changes what you say. You know, when you look by the natural and we look at our lives through natural eyes, all you can see is what you don't have. You stand in a queue at the post office or go to the hospital or go to the doctor's appointment or talk to your family on the, on the phone tonight sometimes. There's almost a fellowship really in, <laughs> in lack where people will talk about, oh, we don't have this and we don't have that and the government should do this and why didn't she do that and why didn't he do that? You know, all you can see is what you don't have. But to see by the Spirit is to be like Paul and Silas in that jail cell in Philippi where you, you maybe had the worst day of your life and yet you're worshipping because you can see that all the bad things that happen to you do not determine your identity. What the Father has said is who you are, you know. Now, when you don't know that, and we all grow in that revelation. We're all growing, as uh, David was sharing and Loreen as well. Uh, in fact, God's doing a great work in us to call us up into who we really are, you know? I know that if the Lord was to come back tonight, that's not a prophetic word, you're okay, all right? Mind you, I'd rejoice. If the Lord was to come back tonight, we would be caught up. The Bible says you're caught up in the twinkling of an eye. Sometimes, I, I'm gonna say things here tonight and you might listen to what I'm going to say, and you might think to yourself, well, that's okay for him to say, but what about? We're very good at that in Northern Ireland, aren't we? But what about? But what about? And it's true. Sometimes these beautiful things that we say that are true about who we are, about how good God is, that we've been blessed, you know, how does that line up really with our lives when everything appears to be going wrong? And it appears that everything's broken, relationships are broken, and each of us, if we hold our hands up before God, we act in a very broken way sometimes. We can have a very, very bad week where people may look at you and say, well, you don't look like you preached on Sunday now, do you? Why is that? The reason for that is because although I am who he says I am, my mind has not caught up yet. My mind has not caught up with what God has done. You see, we sang it tonight. He has done it all. He has done it all. When Jesus was at the cross, he said, it is finished. But my mind has not caught up yet with what is true about me. Like we have a, we, we, I sound like Maggie Thatcher, we have become a grandparent. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> Only showing your age, you remember that? When Maggie came out, we have become a grandparent. She said, she was using the royal we. People thought, who do you think you are, the queen, you know? Anyway, I was gonna say, myself and my wife became grandparents this year, you know? <laughs> and our granddaughter, she's called Ava. She's 10 months of age. And I think I've managed to wangle her into every sermon I've preached and said. <laughs> Because the Lord is really speaking to me through her life. And I'll tell you why. Because 
she's being formed by the words of her parents. They are speaking over her. You know what they believe about her? They actually believe that she's the most precious girl in the whole world. Do you believe me when I say they believe that? They actually believe that, you know? You know what? If she keeps listening to them talk like that, she's going to believe that too. Now, that's how the Holy Spirit works. To preach the gospel in the power of the Spirit is not to tell people who they could be if they clean their act up a little bit more. It's to tell them who they are. And tell them who they are, and tell them who they are, and tell them who they are, and tell them who they are on their worst day. Not on their best day. On your worst day. If you can be told by the Holy Spirit, you are a child of God. That's the best thing you can hear on your worst day, you know. Because remember the gospel said, it's not when you were powerful that God did something for you. At just the right time when we were powerless, Christ died for us, you know. So never forget that. As Pastor David was saying, it's not about our love for him. It's about his love for us. The Apostle John wrote that. He said, this is love. Not that we loved him, but that he loved us. Praise God. So the gospel is not a you first message. It's a he first message. And I think understanding that has really helped me, you know. So what the Holy Spirit is telling me all, all the time, he's calling me by my name in Christ. Now, if God was to speak to me according to my performance, he'd probably say, I don't know what he'd say. I mean, if he, if he spoke to me according to how I was doing, he'd... <laughs> And for years, I grew up in church, and I really believed God looked at me. Because everything I was hearing was that he wasn't happy. I had to ask for forgiveness again. I had to do this. I had to do that. He wanted more and more and more and more and more. No wonder I ended up thinking, when will this fella ever be pleased? When will have I ever done enough? It kept being put back on me. And you know what? So many people felt like that, that most of my friends, most people I knew, left they just walked away because they were being crushed by the burden of having to produce life yourself. Jesus said that to the Pharisees. He said, you're putting burdens on people and you won't lift a finger to lift them off. My burden is easy and my yoke is light, he said, because I'm not going to put something on you and ask you to produce life. You cannot produce life for yourself. Jesus said that to the woman at the well. This water, you drink this water, you're going to be thirsty again. But the water I give you we come in you a spring, you'll never be thirsty again, you know. So when you understand that it's about my life given to you, not your best life for me, it's a totally different way to think. And for years now, I suppose, as long as I had fuel in the tank, it was my life for God. I'm going to get to the meeting and I'm going to pray and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, you know. And you know what, if you've got a lot of strength, you could do that for quite a while, but there'll come a moment when you break. Because that's a deception, it's not your strength. His strength is made perfect in our weakness. It's in our dependency on him. I'll give you an example. The Lord said this to me a little while ago. There's no such thing as a successful Christian. I'll tell you why. If I brought you to a crash full of 10-month-old children, just like my granddaughter, and let's say there were 15 of them there, and I said to you, sister, pick out the successful toddler. Which one's the successful one? You'd say... I can't pick out the successful 10-month-old. Uh, none of them have a life of their own. They're all totally dependent. None of them are successful in the way you mean successful because they don't have a life of their own. They're all totally dependent. As a Christian, you don't have a life of your own. Your life is the shared life of God, you know. You don't be success on your own as if you did something for God. Here's the gospel. You died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who is our life appears, we shall be just like him, you know? So, I think I told you this story before, but I'm gonna tell it again, because I think it's a lovely illustration. Listen to this. David comes out of the house one morning, he gets up one morning and the whole house is freezing cold and the boiler is broken. And Lorreen says to David, David, the boiler is broken, the house is freezing, get that fixed. So David goes out and who does he bump into but Andy? And he says to Andy, Andy, I'm in trouble. The boiler is broken. The house is freezing. And he says, what sort of boiler do you have? David tells him. And he says, you'll never guess. My boiler was exactly that model. It broke down two years ago. I went on YouTube and got a video. And I know how to fix your boiler. Hold on a minute. And Andy writes down three things David has to do to fix his boiler. Now David comes home. He's delighted. 
He's got three things how to fix his body. He comes in through the door and he's waving his piece of paper to, at Lorraine. Good news, good news, Lorraine, you know. Now Lorraine's got a piece of paper and she waves it back at David. I got new, good news too, you go first. So David says, what do you think, think of this? Three ways to fix the boiler. Isn't that great? Three things and I've got the boiler fixed. What's your good news? And Lorraine says, there you go. It's a receipt for a brand new boiler was fitted this morning for free. <laughs> Now listen very carefully. Religion, religion, self-effort, man-made religion, I don't care what variety it is, Catholic, Protestant, Pentecostal, whatever, religion will always tell you it's your job to fix your life. That is not the gospel. Here's the gospel. You got a brand new life, if you want it. You have a savior, if you want him. Now if you want to be your own savior, there's religion and atheism. Help yourself. But it's the most miserable life in the world, being your own savior. You'll spend the rest of your life comparing yourself with everybody else. And you'll be a misery to live with. Because being your own savior is a miserable life. You know, when the Pharaoh asked God's people to make bricks, do you remember this? And said, you have to go and get the straw yourself and get the mud yourself. That was deemed slavery. Making your own life is slavery, you know. Jesus came to set us free from that. He said, you will be thirsty the rest of your life. I was going to speak tonight from Luke 15 because there was something in that that really touched me a few weeks ago when I was, I was speaking somewhere and the Lord showed me something in that. You don't even have to turn to it because you know that story so well. There's not any person here who doesn't know the story of the prodigal son. Why did he go away? Why did he leave his father? Because he had believed the word that he could be somebody. If you don't hear from God tonight who you are, all that's left to you is to try and be somebody. That's a terrible life, trying to be somebody. If you spend your life trying to be somebody, you know what you've done? You've deferred your hope to another day. And hope deferred makes the heart sick. Proverbs 13, 12. Only a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. Only knowing that God has made you by his grace to be who he sees you to be lifts the burden from you of trying to become somebody, you know. It's a bit of a nightmare living with somebody who's trying to become somebody because they're always thinking of some other day in the future, but they're never enjoying the day they're in. Nothing's ever good enough. I lived like that for years. Nothing was ever good enough. I was missing the daisies at my feet. I remember one day being out with my children in the park in Fermanagh, and they were playing and having a great time, and I was sitting there worrying about church. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, look at your children. Look how they're enjoying life. And look at you, you've been sitting there for an hour worrying about the future. You're missing the day you're in. Most of us either live in regret of the past or worry about the future. Jesus said, look at the birds of the air. Are you not of more worth than them? Do you know how worthy you are? You're worthy of everything I have. Jesus Christ is God's view and opinion of you. He thinks you're worth giving everything to and so he did. So the prodigal son, when he went away, he was listening to the world. I could be somebody. And so off he went. He asked the father, remember, he asked the father for all the inheritance. He took the inheritance and off he went. So let me read to you actually what happened next from Luke 15. If you have your Bibles, you can read this with me. We know, of course, that there was a famine came. He lost all his money. He ended up feeding pigs. Do you remember that? And he was at a low ebb. He went through a very rough time. I don't know if you've been through a rough time this year. Don't be afraid of rough times. Very often it's the worst times in your life that bring you to a place where you realize that it's his life in you that's going to keep you, not your best life, not your best attempts. It's when your best attempts at trying to fix your life come to nothing. Everybody in this room must have experienced that. Well, you had a plan. Anybody had a plan 10 years ago? How's your plan going? Be honest. How's it going? Mine's not going very well. Is it going very well? We all have a plan. What we're going to do is save ourselves. Now, we wouldn't say that as Christians. We'd say, oh, no, 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 no. It's the Lord, you know. He's looking after me. But everybody's got a plan. Everybody's got a plan B, you see. And then your plan goes sideways. And you're left thinking, well, what do I have now? It's only then you can really hear the Holy Spirit saying, what do you have now? You have everything. You have everything. I have not withheld one good thing from you. 
You are the same in my eyes as you were 10 years ago when everybody thought you were brilliant. And today everybody thinks you're rubbish. You haven't changed in my eyes. You're just listening to what people think. Don't take your identity from what people think. The Bible says you're not wise to compare one with another. Don't do that. You know, when Lorreen brought up that beautiful quilt, that I, I was astonished, the colors and that. I mean, that's just so beautiful, you know. There would have been a time years ago, Lorreen, when I would beat myself up thinking, Phelan, why haven't you done that? Look at that. <laughs> you know, look at that woman there. I mean, she's able to do that. You know, what can you do? You're useless. You're useless. You can hardly tie your laces, you know. <laughs> I've learned that that voice is not the Holy Spirit. Don't do that. Don't compare yourself with somebody else. You know, you are unique and precious. You're unique and precious to God. Every person's got a different fingerprint. It's so beautiful, you know. Now, I'm saying this. I'm saying it to my own soul as well as saying it to you. Why do I have to say this to myself? Why do we have to preach this gospel of who you are so often? Because the whole world is not teaching you that. A world that doesn't know a savior can only teach you to save yourself can only say to you, here's what you need to do. Get your pen out. You need to do five things in order to be a good Christian. Lie. You are a Christian by the grace of God. Amen. Every person's here tonight because God's not finished with you. Every person's here tonight by the grace of God. By the grace of God, we've begun this journey. And by the grace of God, we've finished this journey. It's not that he's first started it. It's up to you to finish it. No. He says, the good work I've begun, I will finish. Now, I've got to learn to let him. I got to learn to let him. You know, sometimes when I, when I proclaim the gospel as good news, people sometimes say, yeah, Phelan, but what about the buts? I mean, there's some conditions, isn't there? Well, you, mean, you must get them to do something. I mean, it can't be as easy as just believing. They must do something, you know? So I said, okay, I, okay, I'll, I'll give you something to do. If you want something to do, I'll give you something to do. Here you go, you ready? In the words of Mary, let it be done unto me according to your word. You want to do something? Let him be your savior. Let him be your savior. Accept his magnificent, extravagant, generous word over you, which doesn't line up with anything in your life that's happening right now. Just like it didn't with Gideon, a man who'd felt abandoned by God and useless, standing in a hole in the ground, feeling like a coward. And God says to him, Behold, mighty warrior whom the Lord is with. And Gideon said, Hang on a minute. See, God, when he speaks by the Spirit, does not speak to you according to your record. He speaks to you according to his grace, according to his call on your life. That's why he could say to a man like Ananias, I want you to go and speak to Saul of Tarsus. And I, and I said, hang on a minute, I'm not doing that. That's an evil man. The Lord says, do not see him according to his record. I'll tell you who he is. He's my chosen vessel. You see? To see by the Spirit, like Simeon saw by the Spirit, like I'm asking the Spirit, is to see yourself according to God's word to you, according to his name to you. You know? When Jesus stood under that tree in Jericho and said to Zacchaeus, come down, Zacchaeus, I need to eat at your house today, everybody in that city was furious. Because that was the worst thief in that city. He had hurt almost everybody in that city. And yet Jesus says to him, come down, I need to eat with you today. He was giving his approval. You know why? Because he was not speaking to him according to his record. His mother called him Zacchaeus when he was born. Do you know what Zacchaeus means? Pure and righteous. And 40 years later, whatever it is, Jesus stands under that tree and he says, come on, pure and righteous. You see, when he speaks to you according to what he has done, then he does not see you as anything but perfect in his eyes. Now, the reason you're making a mess of your life, I'll tell you why, because you don't think like that. And I don't think like that. I don't think I do have everything, thank you very much. And out of my way, I need to grab that. <laughs> you see, where is all the world, all the, all the problems of the world, all the sin in the world? It's men trying to save themselves. The apostle Peter said like this, you have been delivered from the corruption that is in this world through lust. And what he meant by that was everybody who doesn't know Christ, is grasping for life. Jesus did not grasp for life. His disciples were shocked at that. They were very concerned for him. The closer he got to the cross, they began to say, you need to do something here. This is getting serious. Do something. Even Pilate didn't want to kill him. Even Pilate was begging him, say something. 
save yourself. He refused. Do you know why? He was absolutely trusting in his father to save him. He knew his father. He knew his father would not lay him in death. He knew that. He believed that. Jesus commended and looked and pointed to Abraham and called him the father of faith. You know, Abraham took his own son to kill him because he believed that God would raise him from the dead. <laughs> now, Jesus, that's the way he lived. He lived innocent of trying to save his own life. That's the beautiful innocence of Christ. That's the innocence he gives us. You don't have to try and save yourself. Your father does that. He has done that through Christ. So when you believe that, it gives you such a peace that you stop trying to justify yourself, stop trying to look to people to give you life. And when you stop looking to people to give you life, an amazing thing happens. You know what you find yourself able to do? You're able to forgive people. You're able to forgive people. Because you can let them go because you know that they can't give you the life they'll never be able to say anything that's really going to bring you peace because their life, your life isn't in their hands. Your life's in God's hands. When you know how rich you are, you can forgive them anything. Jesus on the cross, because he knew who he was, he looked at these people who were killing him and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing because they don't know who they are. So the Holy Spirit comes to reveal to us that we are the children of God. Now that's an impartation of the Spirit. I want to show you that in this beautiful picture that Jesus told about the prodigal son coming home. Let me just read on. It says the prodigal son, verse 17, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I'm dying here with hunger. That's what it is to come to your senses. No matter how many years you've been in the world, striving to make a name for yourself, in the rat race, trying to get a better job, a better house, a better relationship, make a better name for yourself. As long as you're trying to make a name for yourself, you'll struggle to hear the Holy Spirit. You'll struggle to accept the name that he has given you if you're so busy trying to make a name for yourself. This son was finally coming to his senses. He'd been so busy for years trying to make a life for himself. Suddenly, he remembers his father and the life that he already had. My God, even servants in my father's house are better fed than me. What am I doing sitting here? That's what it is to come to your senses, is to come to a recognition of who you are according to the Father. And that just changes everything. It's so beautiful. So he came to his senses, uh, but then he's not quite got a revelation of who his father is. I know it's a very strange story. You might think, how on earth can two sons be in the one house and not know their daddy? Well, welcome to the church. <laughs> guilty as charged <laughs> guilty as charged I had some very funny ideas about God for many years you know how do I know now that I'm getting the right or a better idea of who God is I'll tell you how I know because I find fruit growing in my life that never grew before like patience peace and long suffering not being thrown off as much as I did when things go wrong I find that growing in my life. That's how I know I'm sitting under the gospel, that I've got a true revelation of the Father. Because to see him as he really is, is to find the life of the Son growing in you. Because only a perfectly loved Son reveals a perfectly loving Father. And so to find the life of Christ growing in you is a sign that you're actually getting a proper view of the Father. So I will get up, but he doesn't have quite that view yet. So here's his deal. I'm going to get up, I'm going to go to my Father, and I'm going to say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven. And in your sight, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Can you hear what he's saying? I'm going to pay you back. I'm going to pay you back. You know, many of us as believers, years ago, we heard the gospel. We got saved. And then we threw ourselves into paying him back. And we wondered where the joy went of our salvation, you know. Because we're busy doing this and we're doing that. And after all, that's what a Christian is, isn't it? You have to do all these things, you know. And we do, 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 do. And then we wonder, where's the joy gone? Where's the liberty gone? Where's the freedom gone? Why do I feel so miserable a lot of the time? Why do I compare myself with everybody else and my work with their work? What is all that? It's what this is in his head. I'm going to pay you back. I'm not worthy to be a son. Listen, 
He's the one who determines your worth. Jesus Christ is his view and opinion of your worth. And if he did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? So he was still a long way away. While he was a long way away, his father saw him, felt compassion for him, ran and embraced him and kissed him. That's lovely, isn't it? It doesn't say that, and when the father saw that he'd gone to the field and paid him back, then the father came and embraced and kissed him. It doesn't say that, does it? He, he embraced him in all his filthiness. That's the gospel. He embraces us in all our filthiness. He buried us in himself. That's literally what happened. That son was buried in the arms of the father, you know. And then the son begins to make a speech. Here it is. Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. I was thinking lately when I read that, that's not exactly how it sounded. You know how it sounded? <laughs> because he was buried in the father, you know. Now, if I had been the father, remember he was feeding pigs. Do you think? How do you think he smelled? Maybe you and I might have thought, maybe go back home and wash and I'll give you a good hug then, you know? Sometimes the way we preach the gospel in church, that's what we're saying to people. Why don't you go and have a good wash? Why don't you give up your smoking and your drinking and your cussing and your messing about and then come back and we'll give you a good hug? That's not the gospel. But who do you think you are? Do you think you managed to, in your own will car, clean yourself up? Did you clean yourself up? Or is it not true that everything you have, you received as a gift? And if you received it as a gift, why do you boast as if you didn't? This is the extravagant, scandalous nature of the grace of God. And what, when you receive that nature by the impartation of his words, we hear his beautiful words to you really, it actually removes the fear in your life that caused you to grasp. In other words, his word to you will clean you. It will, it will lift off the burden from your life of trying to save yourself. And a person at rest will be holier by accident than you ever tried to be on purpose. Ever met anybody who's trying to be holy? Ever heard, ever heard yourself say this, I'm just trying to be a good Christian. I'm just trying to be a Christian. There's no such thing as trying to be a Christian. You're a Christian by the grace of God. <laughs> now you can be very trying to people all around you if you're trying to. But you're a Christian by the grace of God, you know. I, I, I thought of this the other day, actually, I shared with our folk at home. Imagine again, I'm going, to, I'm going to use her again, my little granddaughter. Imagine if I was down the town with my wife and we bumped into my son and his wife and they were walking there without our granddaughter. And we said, hey, where's Ava? And they said, oh, uh, we left her at home. Uh, the fridge is full and we taught her how to use the cooker. She's fine. <laughs> She's 10 months of age. What do you think I would say to her? I would say, are you mad? Have you lost your mind? She has no capacity to look after herself. That's how heaven looks at you trying to be a Christian. What are you trying to do? You have no capacity in your flesh to be holy. Receive the gospel. Hear from the Holy Spirit. Be whom God declares you to be. Be by the power of his spirit. Stop trying to become someone. Trying to become is like the most worst life in the world. Be. Be. Imagine if if Nicola came back one day and I was reading a book called How to Be Sure You're Really Married. <laughs> and she said to me, well, well, what are you reading that book for? I'm like, well, I'm not quite sure I'm really married. <laughs> you really are married. I mean, well, you know, and you trying to be married isn't helping our marriage. <laughs> Here's another example. Um, like in an average day, between myself and Nicola, I don't know, I can't tell you how many times I would kiss her or say, love you, or give her a hug, you know. But let's say it was, um, I can't remember, I really don't know. But imagine if I came home one day and on the fridge there was a little note from Nicola which said, if you really love me, you will kiss me eight times a day, you will say I love you 13 times a day, and you'll hug me five times a day if you really love me. Now, before I read that note, I was doing that anyway, right? That was just my heart, the spontaneous. But now that I've read the note, suddenly I'm thinking, am I doing enough? You see what's happened? The note has dropped my view off her and onto myself. And that's what happens really. 
if you sit under too much instruction on what you should be doing to become a good Christian. <laughs> Your view comes off Christ and him crucified and onto you. Off his finished work and onto your unfinished work. And you lose your joy. I mean, you might become look more like a Christian to other Christians, but your family is saying, where's the joy? Where's the liberty? Where's the ability to forgive? Where's the grace and the creativity and the joie de vie? Where is the infectious nature of generosity that people say, how can you be like that? How can you forgive people so easily? You know, Where is that richness in your spirit? which comes from looking at Christ and seeing that in him you have been given everything that is necessary for salvation. As Simeon looked at that baby and said, behold, everything. I can die in peace now. I don't have to worry about my family or whatever. I can go now. Let me go now. Because looking at you, even as a child, even as a helpless babe, God in flesh was able to do everything. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing that the angels, the night that Jesus was born, they said to the shepherds, go and tell everybody, this is good news for all men. Because when they saw God in flesh, they knew it's all over. It's all over. Sometimes I heard somebody give the illustration once, uh, when, when the Allies landed on Normandy Beach in 1944, anybody who knew the strength of America and all the resources that the Americans had, if you were a German who knew that, you would know that the war ended on June the 6th, 1944. The rest was just mopping up. When the angels saw God in flesh, they began to rejoice. As far as they were concerned, it's all over because he finishes what he begins. He finishes what he begins. Now you and I need that same revelation. That every time you hear that accusing voice in your head saying, yeah, but you haven't done this yet, or you haven't done that yet, what about this, what about that? Listen to the Holy Spirit. You are a child of God by the grace of God, not by whether you do well or do poorly or do whatever, because you don't qualify yourself. He qualified you. Colossians chapter 1, thank God we rejoice that the Father has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the Son. Isn't that wonderful? You have been delivered from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of a son. And you didn't do that. So as Paul said to the Galatians, if you've begun in the spirit, don't try and finish in the flesh. Because you'll only estrange yourself from the joy of the Lord, you know. I know you've heard this before. And I love saying it again and again. You know why? Because the world doesn't tell me this. The world keeps pointing me to me. And any message that points you to yourself has no power. If I leave your hope tonight on you doing better, I have done you the greatest disservice. I have put a big weight on your shoulders. I want to take that weight off your shoulders. I want to say, let your faith be on Christ's grip on you, not your grip on him. If you're having such a low time that you can't even pray anymore, that's okay. God put you in a body. There's people around you who will pray for you, pray with you. There's people who still believe in you even when you stop believing in yourself. That's a wonderful thing about being in a body, you know? Sometimes why the work of the enemy is trying to isolate you, get you off all by yourself. Anybody ever had a pity party here? <laughs> yeah, 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 pity parties, pity parties. Woe is me. Look at everything that's happened to me. They never come from the Holy Spirit, you know? That's why it's so offensive. The elder brother in this story was really offended at the generosity to the, to the younger son, you know? Because he was having a pity party for years. Secretly, he was saying to himself, but I've been doing all this work. I've been a good boy. I've been going to all the meetings. I've said all my prayers. I've given all my tithes. And my life's a mess. Where's my blessing? Do you ever feel that inside of you? That's not the Holy Spirit. That's just because you've been feeding from the wrong water. Yeah, that's the water of the world. Well, if you do this for God, he'll do that for you. That's not God. He's not transactional. He gave you everything before you did a thing so that you would never think that his love for you is conditional. He never wanted you to believe that his love for you was conditional in your performance. I hope that you had a mother and a father who were like that. Not all of us did, you know. But that's the, the love of a mother, really, is that whatever you say against her son, that's her son. And that's the, the, the love that Jesus has in his heart for us. 
But if we will believe that and receive that, then we can begin, his life in us can begin to stand up. His life, who he believes us to be. And that's what it is to sit under the gospel. Like my granddaughter sitting under the words of her parents, she will grow up into their view and opinion of her. And their view and opinion of her isn't perfect. But Christ's is. So I'm trusting that she's going to begin to hear his view and opinion, Jesus Christ, and that life begin to be formed in her because that's just a beautiful life. That's just a beautiful life. There is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. God wants to come and just lift the burden tonight and the, the tiredness and the self-absorption that we get into from listening to too much instruction in the world, too much advice. Do you know you can die from advice? You can be advised to death. <laughs> the gospel is not good advice, it's good news. Mm -hmm. It's called the euangelion, it's the announcement. In the ancient world, they had to find a word for the gospel and they chose that word because it was the word that described what happened in an ancient city when a messenger arrived to declare that the city had been saved from death. No messenger in the ancient world ever arrived at a city with advice. They arrived with news. The gospel is not advice that points to you and tells you to clean your act up. It's news that points to Christ and says, your act is cleaned up in Christ. Put it like this, the curtain was brought down on your act 2,000 years ago. When that curtain came down, that was the end of your act, okay? You are now in Christ. And that life rises up in you as we speak to each other after the spirit, not after the flesh. So you're saying, maybe you're listening to me tonight and you're thinking, okay, you haven't told me yet what I have to do. What do I have to do? People say that to Jesus all the time. You know what he said to them? Only believe in God and him who he has sent. Even when Nicodemus said, yeah, but, but, but what do I have to do to be born again? Jesus didn't give him a list of things to do. Do you know why? Because he knew Nicodemus would do them. If I give you a list of things to do, the danger is you'll do them. And then you'll think, I'm a great Christian because I did these things. No, you're a Christian by the grace of God. That's your joy. That's your strength. And that's the good news you have for the worst looking people sitting in that housing estate out there. There's nothing between you and them except the grace of God. And the same grace that found you and me in our situation finds them wherever they are and finds them through the proclamation of the gospel that we'd be so full of his voice telling us who we are that we actually find within ourselves the capacity to speak life over the most unpromising person. Like Simeon could actually see in a helpless baby the salvation of the world. Isn't that an amazing ability? And we have that amazing ability. So please speak to me after the spirit. I know who I am in the flesh, but tell me who I am by the spirit. And if I tell you who you are, that's what we do together. We speak to each other after the Spirit, you know. That's difficult. I must say, that's difficult in a small community of believers. You know why? Because we know each other so well after the flesh. You know this. You can come out of a meeting like this. You can go to your family. Who knows you better than your family? Have you ever struggled sometimes to share the gospel with your family? You know why? Because you know that they know that you know that they know that you know that they know. <laughs> All your weaknesses. And you're sitting there talking like you know Jesus and they're going, oh yeah, but I remember you when you were 15, I remember you. You see, now you've got to overcome that voice in your own head, okay? We all have that voice. I know my weaknesses. I know my faults. But I'm saying that there is a voice of the Holy Spirit who is, who is greater than that. He's greater than that. And the only way that we grow up in Christ is begin to speak to each other after Christ's work, not our own. So even in a small fellowship, we all know each other so well. Praise God. Even here, God gives that ability to prophesy over each other. And I don't necessarily mean standing and speaking in a funny voice. I mean that the, your ordinary, everyday conversation is prophetic because even though this person you're speaking to has let you down, you don't speak to them according to what they did to you. You speak to them according to who Christ says they are. And you speaking to them in that way does something in them. That no amount of you rep, you're, you're rebuking them or reprimanding them will ever do. I, I'll say this nice in my spirit. There's people here, and you have somebody in your family, and you've been on their back for years. It's not doing any good. 
telling them their things they're doing wrong, it's not doing as much good as you think. What they need to hear is who they are according to Christ. Prophesy over them. I know that's difficult sometimes, especially when we know people so well, you know. But God gives us that grace. Praise God. Praise the Lord. God gives you that grace to prophesy, you know. <laughs> that's okay. That happens to me too. Praise God. So that's the ability we have. Every person has that ability to speak by the Spirit. But I can't speak to you that way if I won't speak to my own soul. Praise the Lord. I think the Lord's trying to tell me that's the end of this. I think he's trying to tell me, Phelan, you've spoken too long. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Okay, we'll take the hint. Praise God. So, that's all right. That's all right. So let me say that again. So, <coughs> I said there that there's somebody here, and maybe you've been speaking to a member of your family, and you think you're helping them because you're giving them instruction, instruction, instruction. You know how I do this most with my children? You have such fear sometimes for your children that you end up putting all your fears on them. Oh, you careful, have you got this? Don't do that, watch that, have you done that? Quite careful, watch that. Yeah. And you end up putting all your fears on them, you know? By the Spirit, we can do something better. We can prophesy over them, you know. But in the same way you might do that to your children, the first person you've got to learn to do that with is yourself. You've got to, you've got to do it with yourself. You've got to say to yourself, I'm not going to be subject to my fears anymore. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to be so downcast. I'm not going to go over that in my head over and over again, you know. Remember Naaman, the, the uh, man with leprosy? He went to the prophet and... Uh, he went to the door of the prophet to get healed and the prophet never came out. He sent a servant who said to him, go jump in the river. That's what he said then. Not just once, seven times, by the way. Naaman was furious, furious. He went away and his servants asked him, well, why are you so furious? He said, I was sure that the prophet himself would come out and speak over me, you know? In other words, he had this idea in his head about the way God was going to work. And that's our lives as well. We had this idea in our head years ago that our family was going to turn out a certain way and this is going to happen and this is going to happen to the church and this is going to happen in relationships. It's going to happen, you know. And when it doesn't turn out that way, you can go right in yourself and review in the history and what did they do wrong, whatever, you know. God turns all things to the good yes. for those who love him and are called according to purpose. Don't be afraid of being at the weakest you've ever been in your life because it's at times like that that you're going to find the power of God moving so wonderfully because he doesn't want to bless you when you're at your strongest you know why because you'll get the idea that i have to be strong to be blessed that idea will crush you you'll spend the rest of your life trying to be strong none of us can be strong i'm good being weak so find him in your weakness hear the gospel he hasn't changed his mind about you in your worst day when you know that you're free from the opinions of people you're free from religion and you're at peace and now you'll find your family and people around you coming to you because the peace in you is a supernatural peace. They'll come to you because they can discern from you that they're not going to be judged. People flock to Jesus, prostitutes, tax collectors. Why did they go to him? Because somehow in his presence, they felt innocence. It's not supernatural. They felt that he wasn't going to tell them what to do, but he's going to tell them who they were. And that changed their lives. That's just bar our heads. Oh, Father in heaven, uh, your word is just such a beautiful word to us. It's a, it's a word of liberty. Lord, we have a message of liberty. It is for freedom that we have been set free. The freedom from people's opinions. The freedom from the pressure of this world to produce your own life. Lord, that burden is so crushing. It's even affected people's health in this place. Even affects my health at times, Lord just that crushing burden to try and produce something that looks like a good life. Lord, thank you that you lift that burden to us. Lift that burden off tonight, Father. I just break that burden on people's shoulders tonight. Receive the approval of your Father. Receive the embrace of your Father in all your wretchedness and all the weakness and all the mistakes and everything going on in your life. If you can receive his embrace today, 
and who he declares you to be. You are my child. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Live from there, think from there, speak from there, rest from there, and you will find the fruit of his life growing in your life. And you will find that he never asked you to try and be a Christian. He promised that if you receive the seed of his word, you would find his life growing in your life. And I thank you, Father, that's what I see here tonight. When I look at these beautiful saints, I see your life growing in them. I see them together here because your life is a life that brings all things together. I thank you for every family represented here, that they would have complete confidence tonight that even in family situations that have never looked worse, your strength has never been more powerful through our belief and our rest in you. And so we speak a word of salvation. I thank you, Lord, for uh, this is a season for prodigals coming back. This is a season, Lord, for forgiveness flowing. This is a season, Lord, for even the church going through a growth spurt where we don't need people to tell us anything about ourselves because we've heard your voice and your voice settles the matter. Your voice is the last word on who we are, not our performance. We thank you for this beautiful gospel. We thank you that you take the things that are not. You take the weak and foolish things, and that's us. Yes. And we thank you that you've taken us, and we're just being formed under your beautiful words. We declare this in Jesus' name. Praise God.